Managing Violence Podcast, Season 5, Episode 1, with Michael Van Beek. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Managing Violence Podcast. Thank you so much for coming back and joining us here for Season 5. Who would have thought we'd get to five seasons? Not I, that's for sure. Thank you so much to all you valuable listeners, and especially to our Patreon subscribers who keep us going financially, morally. You guys are the bomb. Thanks. Patreon.com forward slash Managing Violence to check out all the perks and the bonus content for this episode and everything in Season 4. My guest today for the first episode of Season 5 is Michael Van Beek. Uh, If you haven't heard of Michael, he is an established martial artist, a great mind of the martial arts. He has a way with words which you will really enjoy. Uh, Lifelong martial artist, but but probably the most interesting thing about Michael was the turn his life took at one stage where he ended up on the street. He ended up uh, as a, well, basically living as a criminal, struggling to survive. And uh, his journey from uh, respected martial arts instructor to petty criminal and then his rehabilitation uh, out of that life back to running martial arts schools and, uh, and really getting his life back on track is a fascinating story. And he provides an insight into violence that uh, most of us cannot, uh, can, cannot talk about because we haven't lived that life. And uh, it, it was a great pleasure to talk to Michael. I was super impressed uh, with everything he had to say, I think this is possibly one of the most practical episodes I've ever done. I think there'll be more takeaways from this episode than just about any other. Uh, it was a real sleeper episode for me. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know much about Michael before uh, before I started researching him. And uh, I was so impressed with the quality of this conversation and him as a human being. I think you're going to really dig it. If you'd like to hear bonus content from Michael or all the other guests, head on over to patreon.com forward slash managing violence. Here is Michael Van Beek. Michael, thank you very much for joining us here on the Managing Violence Podcast. It's great to have you on for season five, episode one. First guest of the new season, welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on uh, the, the company that you keep on your show. Uh, yeah, kind of honored. Thank you so much. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. You're recommended by a listener. And uh, as I started to dive into your story and your background, it was uh, certainly an episode that I think will will have a lot of value for our listeners. So, uh, <coughs> Michael, for, for those that don't know you, uh, I'm not going to attempt to tell your story because uh, I think it's, a, it's the kind of story that, that needs to come from the source. Can you, uh, can you start us at the beginning uh, with uh, growing up and martial arts and, and how all that started out for you? Sure. Um, I imagine that my story is like many others. I imagine that there's some some sense of that hero logos where you have to confront yourself as the enemy. And that common theme tends to run through a lot of people I'm sure you have on your show, but and mine's no different. Um, my mother and uh, birth father split. As it, my, it's my first memory is of my father leaving. Subsequently, you know, yeah, just not good from there. And then uh, my mother reestablished herself, got back into school. Right from there, I tested into special ed in 1976. And so if you have never been in special ed in 1976, it's not the most joyous place to be. There is a, a very, children are very brutally honest. And so to handle, you know, this kind of uh, fast paced life of going from having an abandoned father to moving to being in a new situation, new school. And I'm in a special class where people are making fun of me. My mother put me in a a local karate class to help curb the social stigma that occurs from being in that kind of environment in 1976. It wasn't like there wasn't the cute girl coming to ask you to prom, but it didn't happen then, you know, (laughs) So uh, that was a different time. And so that kind of, you know, I was still very insecure, very, I was one of them. My structure was one built on capitulation. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it was based on that, 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 that I'm going to sit back and there's a lot of evil in the world and nothing is like the storybooks. And I'm just going to sit back and try not to become a bigger victim of it than I already have. Mm. And so this passive nature overwhelms me, this desire to just want someone to be my friend. And, I, and I, it's not a martial art thing, but it's a thing. You understand? It's a thing for me. It's an anchor. Because when I look at people who are violent and I try to teach my children, my kids' classes, you know, and I'm a reality-based guy, so I try to give them that to which I was negligent of or lacked in nutritional self-value. And so the martial arts became the lighthouse in the fog of that light, of that life. You know, the lighthouse that kind of just kept me, gave me a sense of self, gave me a purpose, gave me this thing that I could do, but I was too insecure about it to do it in front of other people, if you will. You know, so like anyway, I went on through the martial arts, through high school and stuff, got back into the mainstream classes, you know, went out, got high, drank, did high school stuff and, you know, <laughs> got in your normal trouble and stayed with it though. And I got into um, Jeet Kune Do, right, um, right after high school and uh, started getting into lifting and stuff and started to appreciate the athleticism within martial arts that I had previously lacked because it was, you know, majority was, you know, white ninja Bruce Lee kind of mentality. It, there, yep. was, there was very little, you know, anything else. So at any rate, uh, I, I, liked, um, I liked the athleticism. And so... Um, I met this, I seen these videos in the back of magazines because we didn't have the internet. You know, we weren't that fortunate. We had to really research. You actually had to buy a plane ticket or a drive to do something. <laughs> I know this sounds really crazy to some. Oh. But uh, yeah, so I met this cat named Paul Vunak. Right. And I actually, I actually was going to, go ahead. I was just going to say, Paul Vunak is a, is a legend. Uh, I, I still have some of his VHS tapes. I've got nothing to play them <laughs> on, but I've still got the tapes. Good on you, man. Mm. Yeah, and so I actually was doing. I I went to um, I went to school for criminal justice, and I went to, as a as a correspondence class. Went to ESA bodyguard school. I was working with some guys who were doing some protection specialist stuff. These were police martial artists. I was just in this group of people, you know, and uh, who were martial artists slash police officers slash bodyguards slash security people slash march, you know. And so we we're all kickboxers and part of this group. And so I went to this bodyguard stuff and uh, I went to a seminar, Danny Nassano seminar and Paul Bunak was there. And he just, he did half the seminar and I was just, you know, I didn't pay for it. So I was just speaking, peeking my head in. And I was like, what in the heck is this guy doing? There's no <laughs> forms. There's no nothing. He put a motorcycle helmet on this guy and beat the living crap out of me. This was nothing like I had seen. But because I had been beat up and picked on, now you have to remember, I was put in karate, but I was still beat up and picked on because I was too insecure to use it. I really was. I didn't have enough confidence in myself to mm -hmm. use the stuff I had learned. So I was still taking, just taking lumps, man, taking lumps. Of, you know, I just didn't understand what it meant to stand up for yourself. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that was it for me, man. I went home and sold all my stuff through all my black belt certificates. Cause you know, I had black belts by then, you know, I'd been in a, mm -hmm. 10 years at that point, you know? And so I had been, uh, I went out for the Olympics, uh, you know, it, 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 in the regional States, it was very, I mean, there was a lot of martial art movies and stuff. And so you almost started to convince yourself, well, maybe it didn't work in a street fight because, well, I just wasn't that good at it. So as soon as I get that black belt, yeah. And then when you get the black belt and someone tries to hurt you, not hit you, but someone tries to hurt you. Now, I, we're from the south burbs of Chicago, and the south side of Chicago just continues into the burbs. There's no nice really part of the south side of Chicago. <laughs> so that was always being put to you. Reality was a very, there's just, there's no way around that. You can't pretend your way out in, in point sparring. That's not the same. And so there was always this reality of truth that was chasing me and tapping me on my shoulder that says, man, you know better. You know better. Right? So <clears throat> anyway, as a student of Vunax for many, many years, he introduced me to Thomas Cruz, his right-hand guy, and he was like one of my best friends ever. And we just, that's just the life that we live, that reality-based mentality junkie. 
you know, but yeah. it was still from a Jeet Kune Do perspective. So there was still trapping and there was still reference points and it was still those things and it was still feeds. And then part of uh, the Bruce Lee thing or the Bunak thing is he would go out and he'd give you things to do. Well, I had to go out. Some people were doing Wing Chun. I had to go out and do uh, cage fighting. Right. And so I had to go out and look and find the best cage fighter. So I found a dude named uh, Matt Thornton. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I've, I've had Matt on the podcast. I know you have brother. And, uh, Went to some of his seminars, bought his tapes. And right away, if you're a JKD guy and if you're a student of nature, you can immediately tell you that this guy has a level of insight. Mm -hmm. We'll call it intelligence. It's in, in a different kind of intelligence, but it's insight. This man is willing. It's not some, I don't know. It's his ability to say, I'm going to call bullshit and let's see, who's, let's see who, <laughs> who calls me on it, you know? So in other words, he would, he would say, listen, just call me coach. You don't have to call me Sifu. You can pox all up, so I'll just slap his hand out. He, he simplified everything and said, listen, yeah, yeah. it's stand up, clinch, and ground. So he is actu the actual, I don't know if people give him credit or not, but I see him as the actual architect of what we call modern day MMA. Yeah, he, he was certainly very influential. And I, and I think from my perspective with Matt, he was one of the first to really broke down how to coach it. It's, it's one thing to fight, but he, he really systematized how you go about transferring skills. And I, I think that was, to me, that's Matt's biggest contribution um, is, is just the, the quality of coaches that he's generated and the resources. Yeah, he, he put out. He is, for me, he is the structure of the rise of the athlete. Yeah. In, into martial arts. We didn't see that even in MMA. Even in MMA, in, in the Gracie days, it was still technique. It was still style versus style. Matt Thornton leveled the playing field and then made it a matter of athleticism. Your ranges are very simple. They're, they're, everything that's Olympic in sports is confined in hybrid and fused into one MMA match. Judo, wrestling, Thai boxing, boxing, yes. So it's very, you know, his attitude was Bruce Lee's. Simplify and then make it the athleticism. Now, I had been with Paul Vunak for years at this time already. And for me, Paul was the first one who did it. See, he just wasn't barbaric with a straight blast and a headbutt, and that was impressive. His impressive is what, how he used what he called attributes to attain superiority rather than using a technique or a position and be superior at it. He used how he trained and the realism in which he trained. And so he had that same thought process. And so you found people with those thought processes, as if you were me, you're looking for people with mutual thought processes that are delivering principles, patterns that give you a high yield of return. Absolutely. And so, is, is yeah. this the, so just to just get the time frame, this is what, mid nineties? Yes, sir. Mid nineties. Yeah. Yeah. And so I started, I started cage fighting career. Um, <clears throat> I had a lot of good coaches. Um, Bob Shermer is another Chicago guy. He's a legend in Chicago um, in the martial arts scene. He's one of the guys who, who fought like Hicks and Gracie, and he was a ground fighting guy. And so needless to say, those were early UFC days. You know, my first fight had Kempo gloves and a pair of cutoff shorts. <laughs> in a boxing I those ring. gloves. Yeah, yeah. In a boxing ring with no rounds. It went 13 yeah. minutes, 52 seconds, Joe. Yeah, you know? it was, was it one of the? I remember a couple of shows where fighters could actually bring their own gloves. Like the, the promoters didn't have gloves, so you like you just bring your own. I'll never forget it. I even forgot my mouthpiece. I was so nervous. <laughs> I had cuts. You know, I had the cuts all inside the mouth. When you don't wear a mouthpiece and you fight like that, you get cuts all inside your mouth. Anyway, yeah, uh, just to just so to back to the yeah, sorry, just, just to, uh, before we move on further in the story, I just want to ask you a question about uh, ESA, uh, because that, what, for, the, for those that don't know, I mean, ESA was one of the top bodyguarding schools, certainly in the US, um, and, and internationally was renowned as one of the, the better places to go to learn how to be a bodyguard. I'm just curious how you found that, um, like, um, broadening your knowledge of security, exact, especially. Well, I was going, it was the crowd I was in, right? And that's what it was. It was really about who you hung with. And you hung with people who, who is, and it was just a level of how thirsty are you? Do you want to go to karate class? And yeah, you're going to be, I was going to school to, uh, for criminal justice. And so who am I going to swim with? How good do I want to be? If I'm going to lift, do I, what do I want to do? I exercise or do I want to find the biggest guys in the gym and hang out with them? And mm -hmm. so I was just, you know, is that kid who is passive, who didn't say nothing, who just found, yeah. That's what I did. I just attached myself to those people. And so uh, it, that was a correspondence course found in by the group I was working with called Protection Specialist. One of the guys who ran that introduced me to the, one of the teachers there. 
And so you could take correspondence courses there. You could take, they would send you video, VHS videos through the mail. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is old school, bro. Yeah. You know, it was, it took a long, it, it, it was the, what I call the decade of effort. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, 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 if for me in that time of my life, the nine days were the nineties were the decade of effort. It's where I went to the, the, to the greatest of my resources to find the best I could in every resource. I actually, in my cage fighting career, I fought my last cage fight in 2007, and I fought it on Dan Seven card. My first one of uh, I fought it the same card as Matt Hughes. The wow. day Pat Mil yes, the ba the day Pat Militich took Matt Hughes um, to the UFC, we were there. We fought in the same card. <clears throat> wow. My last fight was on the card with Dan Severin, um, uh, and Eddie Eddie Cohen was my coach. Eddie Cohen is one of the world's strongest man he's the greatest yeah. power lift of I, all time i know i know eddie cohen as well he's a and, and a, a jeet kune do guy as well if i remember correctly because of me yes oh really ah, yes sir it's uh, see, i knew i knew ed through powerlifting i mean i knew all yeah, yeah. i should say through powerlifting and uh it was only he started coming out to australia a couple of years ago um because we've, we had a really good powerlifting scene here and i got invited out and uh, made friends with some guys here that i knew and uh, they started talking about him always wanting to demonstrate his martial arts. And I'm like, really? <laughs> really? I didn't know Ed Cullen was a martial artist. <laughs> That's you. Well done. He looks like a teddy bear, don't he? He looks like a, yeah. Um, um, he, even, with, even with two fake hips, he'll still, uh, he's still the strongest guy in the room. I have, to, I have to take a second and talk about that guy for a second. Because I first met him. Somebody said, Mike, Mike's cage fighting. He's got a big fight coming up. This is going to be his last one. I'm going to introduce you to this guy. He introduced me to this guy at this gym. He's Eddie Cohen. I hear all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. What do I know? I'm a fighter. I, you know, and I'm a scrapper. What? Mm -hmm. And so I, I meet him and I said, hey, I heard you're like a super strong guy. He said, yeah, that's what they say. He was super humble. I said, you want to wrestle? <laughs> he, said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, okay. So we go downstairs in the bathroom of Quad's gym. <laughs> Quad's gym yep. is one of the world's most famous powerlifting gyms, you yep. know. And um, so we go to the basement and we just start wrestling. And he was so humble. I'm going to tell you how hard it is to choke out a guy with a neck like Ed Cohen's. <laughs> Let me tell you, you got your work cut out for you. <laughs> but anyway, he was, a, he was a complete humble gentleman, right? You see this guy who squats over a thousand pounds at his tip of his career, right? That's unhuman for a man under 250. That is unhuman. Yeah. So to have that kind of dedication and then to watch him go, you know what, Mike, I want to jump. I want to drink your Kool-Aid. Let's go. Let's go. Hmm. Okay. And so for a guy who was, you know, he's hitting 50 at the time. He didn't, I mean, he's transferred. I mean, obviously he's still putting up 700 pounds even to this day. That being said, <clears throat> you know, He's trying to a power lifting structure to transfer that over to martial arts was a very, very, very tasking thing to do. But yeah. he showed up every day for years. I mean, mm. he was so dedicated and so humble. I've become friends with his family. They're like extended family of mine and my wife's. It's just, yes, I can't say enough about that guy. So that's that. very cool. Yeah. Sorry. I, I interrupted you. We're, uh, we're in cage fighting. You're training with Matt Thornton. Um, I was, I wasn't training with Matt Thornton, but I knew that he was the best mental operating right. system to run from when it came right. to MMA. Okay. And so sure. then I had, I had his ment I had his operating system of uh, stand up clinch ground. I had coaches, <laughs> Gracie coaches in the ground. I went and trained with the Gracie's in the early nineties out in California and Torrance. I was introduced to them but to, uh, through Vunak. They introduced me to them. So I had kind of, I had kind of an in, so that was kind of cool. Um, so yeah, I did some cage fighting stuff and, and, and life was life, man. Everything was great. And I, I failed several times at opening up martial arts schools and I couldn't, I wasn't good at business, Joe, you know? Yeah. No one taught me that stuff. I didn't, I didn't, I just, I thought like everybody else, you open up a door, you come up with somebody money somehow, somebody's going to loan you some money somewhere. And it's probably some dude you really don't want to owe money to. <laughs> this yeah. is the South side yeah. of Chicago, Joe. You know what I mean? <laughs> These are our options and they're not many. And that's okay though. Cause we're, 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 we're effort. Right. So yep. yeah, all that stuff. So, um, yeah. So I failed several times at that. That didn't go well. And then, you know, life started kicking me in the teeth. You know, I was a full instructor of Paul Vunex, a senior instructor, actually. And I was making moves, doing things, but nothing seemed to hit business-wise. Um, I hit divorce. Um, 
just had a baby, had divorced, uh, job loss. Then I decided to get, start trying to, uh, I partied on the weekends. I was already a weed smoker, so why not, you know, hit a line here and there and do some cocaine? Why not? That's what you, you know what I mean? We're partying. I'm, mm-hmm. You know, I'm single now. And so that's, you know, that's what I did to myself and put myself in some bad spots and turned a snowball into an avalanche of my life. Yeah. Very quickly, within a matter of years, I was, you know, a well-respected martial arts business owner, and then nobody would give me 10 bucks for or the time of day in a room full of clocks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't trust me to give them the time of day in a room full of clocks. Yeah. So, you know, and so that put me on the streets real fast, you know, and, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm as white as Richie Cunningham. And, you know, the south side of Chicago in the city trying to score cr- crack cocaine at four in the morning on Martin Luther King Drive. Nah, man. Yeah. Nah, man. Yeah. Wow, man. And so people want to hear stories, Joe. You know, people talk about stories. Man, you don't want those stories. Those stories aren't pretty. I mean, they're, they're movies for those stories. These aren't real stories. Mm. Fights are ugly. They're nasty. You go home and you cry. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, this is reality, man. This is not the same. This is not the same. And this is when I would part, I would part ways with people like Matt Thornton. I, I love him for what he was able to give me, but a certain perspective. I mean, if you've ever, have you, I don't know if you've ever met Matt. Matt's like six, seven. He is ridiculously huge. He's huge. He's huge. Yeah, so I don't know that, you know, that, that it, while I appreciate the knowledge of the man, I think that there's a different perspective when you are a victim. I don't, you know, Matt's an athlete, B67 surfer, just, yeah, super smart, great writer. But I don't know that he, yeah. So there's a lot of people who, I think knowing what it feels like to be a victim, especially when you're an addict, because then you blame yourself. Mm. Of course, somebody hit me over the head with a pipe. I'm an addict. <laughs> you know, that's what yeah, happens yeah. in this world. I'm on the streets. I live in the streets. We, we, yeah. You know, you would have deals. You'd say, okay, I'm going to have this hooker pull this guy over to the side of the road and as soon as his head goes back, I'm going to pull the door open and light his ass up. What's he going to mm-hmm. do? Call the cops? Mm, mm, mm. And you know what? I bet you never, I, I bet you doesn't, I bet you go home and loves on his wife and doesn't pick up a hooker again. You're welcome. But this was the kind of, you know, it's stupid logic, but that's what you yeah. tell yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I think that's, um, it's such a fascinating and important uh, aspect of, of violence is that in martial arts, uh, look, the vast majority of people that, that study martial arts are what you'd consider, quote, unquote, good people. You know, they're, they're, they're middle class, they're stable, they're, they don't have a, you know, a lot of exposure to real violence. And it's very easy to think you're preparing to fight the, the bad guy. You know, you're, you're preparing to fight the guy that jumps out of the bushes or the home invader. Or, and, and, but they're, they're such two-dimensional characters that we're trying to defend ourselves against. We're not really thinking about who is this human being and what has led them to be where they are. And uh, you know, is this guy who's trying to score crack on the corner a well-respected martial artist who had a couple of bad turns in life and has ended up right where he is now? as opposed to a two dimensional stick figure bad guy from a movie, you know? And, and I think that is such an important and misunderstood and, uh, and neglected part of understanding violence as a whole is, is who is the perpetrator? Why are they doing what they do? Um, and how do we fix that? <clears throat> yeah. I go into great deal about that. I'm actually uh, working on a, a, a um, we're in the editing process. The book is done. It's an editing process. Uh, we hit a hard time here, obviously, globally, and it, it slammed the brakes on a lot of things. And so, but we're still pushing forward. That book is called The War Room, Decoding Violence. Well, we, the obvious best way to look at any violent situation is from the inside out. And so we'll talk about that further. But, you know, drug, uh, the jail, Cook County Jail in Chicago, that life for me was uh, sobering, you know, if anything. But I, I did it. I mean, how many times, how many times I've been, month here, month there, been in been arrested. I mean, a lot of times it's, you know, mm-hmm. I've been in knife fights. I've been shot at it's, it, it. And it, it, it sounds cool to some people. And I, and I know people who have not been in those situations. They hope for the opportunity yeah. for validation of what they train. Mm-hmm. I know they do. I know they do, mm-hmm. but you really don't. So in my training, I tried to provide the best validation possible. Right. Yep. So that when they're, so that you listen, you don't, this could go so many ways sideways. 
I was in a fight one time where I pulled my knife out. It was a folder at the time. I was working at a bar, taking the trash out, and the guy had kicked out. Came went home and got an actual butcher knife and came at me with that knife. I flipped that folder open and it fell out of my hands. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Woo! This ain't the same as a cage fight, Joe. I'm telling you, this is a different feel. There's a different mm. energy. It's like, you know, when you, when, when you touch something that's magnet or electrified and you feel that jolt, mm-hmm. there's something like that that hits you that's different. Yeah. It's a sense of, I could die yeah, 100%. here right now. It, it's, it's such a different thing, as you said. I mean, it, it, and, I, and I connected even back to what you said about you know, growing up doing karate, but you're still getting picked on because you didn't have the confidence to use it. It's that, that mindset that is that is lacking regardless of physical skills and i think that is a crucial element that it's it's hard to well it's, it's not it's not impossible but it, it can be difficult to parlay that mindset of what real violence is going to feel like because unless you unless you're mentally prepared for it and you're emotionally prepared for it no amount of physical skills is going to help you uh, well, let's talk about that balance here shortly sure. i think that that's a really good idea and i i have an article on my website it's called will and skill the siblings of war. Mm, good title. <laughs> I know, right? It popped in my head at the last minute. I, I, I really don't want to take credit for it. It was just coming to, but yes, that they are things in constant, in, in constant uh, battle with each other for superior uh, position within the relationship, in the sibling relationship, who's loved more kind of thing. One group <laughs> says one, one group says the other. But um, I want to real quick because how I came about that is a matter of that story that I want to finish really quickly. That, that story, let's just fast forward. I'm recovered. I'm sober. Um, whatever that looks like. I'm right. I'm good. Right. I'm still attend meetings. I still check myself. I keep myself accountable to higher people, higher power, higher, all that stuff. So I'm in a good place and I've met people. I've joined the, the rejoined the ranks of Paul Bunak. I've done all kinds of cool stuff and people had heard stories about me, yada, yada. So now I find myself in positions that I wasn't before simply from things that were heard about me. I uh, opened up my own business and changed from Jeet Kune Do to focus counter violence. Because when I looked back at the life I lived as a street guy, as a security guy, as a bouncer, as a martial artist, and getting myself sober, I had to move to the city to anywhere I could to live. And someone put me up in their place. And I worked bouncing all over the city of Chicago. And uh, so all of the things I had learned, what does it mean? This is a lot of stuff. Cage fighting, bouncing, getting my butt kicked as a kid, karate, black belts, Jeet Kune Do, attribute training, and all this stuff. What does this mean? You know, meeting the grace. I don't know. And so mm-hmm. trying to put perspective to it, I was constantly brought back to a place of violence. And when I, re, when I refocused my energy on violence, into my life came these people like Lee Morrison and Don Rosso and uh, 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 amazing people. I, I can't even say some of their names because they're deep. But I, I just say that I'm very fortunate. And they showed me the power of will. Guys like Lee Morrison, he, he, he is 100% Will. That, in my opinion, that guy is about as savage as they come. Lee Morrison. And he is one of the most intense individuals I've ever had a chance to talk to. <laughs> yeah, I can't say enough about that. I love that guy. You know, there's a, again, that's a guy I look at and I don't, unlike, uh, unlike some of the other people like Paul and like, you know, my other people that have influenced me in my life. When I met Lee, it was like, there's my, it, he, this guy's my brother. He's literally like my brother from across the pond. We were separated from birth. That's mm. kind of how I, I, I felt around him, you know? And he was very, very giving with compliments. He's very giving. He'll say, this is where I learned from this. He, used, he actually uses some of my stuff in his teaching. He came out and trained with me at my place for about three hours we trained. There's a mm. video out there called The Clinch. I, he came in, uh, he wanted my perspective on The Clinch. And so, um, yeah. And so it was an amazing training session. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a long video. He took the video, his girlfriend took and made a video out of it. And it, uh, I thought it was a pretty good video anyway. I mean, cause we were just freestyling. We're just talking, hanging out and training all day. We, there was no, you know, and so mm-hmm. whenever I get a chance to see him, I see him, I'll go to his seminars, you know, and again, I'll go to a seminar and sit in the back. Like I'm a first time student mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for Lee or for anybody. You know what I'm saying? Because I know, I don't care if it's Paul, I don't care who it's, it, I don't care how long I've been in the game. There's always something there for me to learn. 
And so that's kind of what rounds out that story. And that's where I'm at with focus is it's just a culmination of amazing people in some of the darkest times of my life. Yeah. It's, and that's, it's so powerful. Actually, just before we move on from Lee, I just wanted to say uh, when I had a chance to interview Lee uh, a couple of months ago and uh, I, I draw a very interesting uh, parallel between Lee and the late crocodile hunter, Steve Irwin, right? Because <laughs> um, I had the pleasure to know Steve. Um, I, I grew up not far away from the zoo mm. and his family was quite well known in the area. And uh, what a, the parallel I draw, even though you couldn't find probably two more different human beings in terms of their, <laughs> what, what their approach to life is, is that you'd, you'd watch Steve on TV and you would think that like this has to be a character like mm. it's, it's it's obviously he's, he's dialed it up in intensity and then you meet him in real life and that's the exact same guy uh like he, he was everything you saw on tv was exactly him and actually had a passion for uh, jiu-jitsu and wrestling as well uh, he um uh, uh, his his bodyguard was a guy named dan higgins who uh fought in rings uh in japan and uh did some of the early no holds barred was one of my first wrestling coaches. Um, and he, uh, used to get Dan to teach him, uh, jujitsu and wrestling at the zoo. Uh, they had a wrestling room set up. Mm -hmm. So there's actually some cool photos of Steve wrestling, uh, with these, uh, early MMA guys from the late nineties, early two thousands, uh, still in his car keys, by the way. But, um, the, um, yeah, the parallel there is that when I talked to Lee, I was like, man, this is exactly the same guy. Like I'm talking to him at seven o'clock in the morning on the phone and he is exactly the same guy as he is on the, on his instructionals, like the intensity, everything is real and raw. Yeah. He was, uh, he is the archetype of that street thing. And, and I like that. Cause I mean, he, I mean, he is a good, he has a good package. Yes. He has a sexy voice. He's got the, just yeah, the, the English Aussie mixed voice. He's got the, uh, <laughs> he's got something going on there. The way he stands, he's got the, yeah. The, yeah, the, I mean, the, he's, the guy he's just the, really wants to help people. That's why I like him. Yeah. He, I'm, I mean, I've met so many hard asses, bad asses, tough guys and blah, blah, blah. And when you meet people that are, that are scarred up from the, you know, through the door, you can just tell these guys have been taking an ass whooping for their yeah. whole life, one way, shape or form. You know what I'm saying? This is yeah. partly what makes us tough. And, and, but man, he just wants to help people, mm. you know? And that's why I, I like the people that I, that I, that I play with now and um, pursue now, because we're about helping the virtue you talked about the middle class or just a regular guy. And, Mm -hmm. And that doesn't recognize that person. And I think it's, it's, it's I distinguish that person in terms of being virtuous, the, the, the stoic term, kind of virtuous. Like, I may not be perfect, but my intention is to be better, right? And the yep. things that I do are to be better. And a lot of times when I look at men who come into my training, it's difficult to get men to train because most men would rather look good losing than look good, uh, uh, would look good, yeah, they'd rather look good losing than look bad learning, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so when I get men to come in, it's like they usually start with that, I want to be better. And there's that course. Like, not like I necessarily want to learn how to fight. That might be the easy part. The hard part is showing up every day, being disciplined, saying I don't know, doing those things, doing what I know this is going to ask of me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. What do you think is that, that missing element uh, when it comes to understanding the victim's perspective on violence? I mean, you, you've, you've been the victim as a child. You then, uh, you know, obviously learn a lot of, you, you get a lot of skills and then you learn a lot from, from Vunak and, and Matt Thornton. You've been the athlete uh, and yeah, conceivably once you're, once you're an athlete, you're a, you're a much harder target. So I guess that, that resolves some of that. But, and then you end up on the street where you are constantly at risk of being victimized, but you're also potentially a predator looking, for, looking to take advantage. How does that psychology um, evolve for you? It's, it depends upon what side of the coin I'm on that day. And that's, it started because those were my two places, my two personalities that I justified violence. I justified violence in terms of fighting for money on the streets from dealers who knew people who would fight me because they thought they could beat a crackhead. I knew it from a place of being victimized by people who knew I could fight. So they brought more than two people with weapons, <clears throat> right? But aren't going to catch a murder rap, <laughs> right? So... Mm -hmm. The other side is saying, I'm, 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 which side of my coin am I on? I, you have to be a victim of it. You have to. And so in looking at how I train it, and I think that was your question, is that what is missing in terms of that victimization? Yeah. I think it's understanding it from a person who wishes to harm somebody. 
Only then can you see where the victim truly is in somebody because you seek their holes. You look at their weaknesses. You try to get into their white. Mm -hmm. You try to penetrate that, whether it happens in seconds or whether it happens over, time, over days. You try to penetrate that. And so if you don't desensitize the people you're training to what that looks like, then it will shock them regardless of their skill or will level. It's about experiencing um, flight time of that which is haunting you. So the, the successful hunter knows the habits of his prey. So you have to know what's haunting you. Yeah. What's haunting you? Violence. Okay, violence is haunting you. In which way is violence haunting you? Mm -hmm. And then you have to ask yourself, what drives violence? And therein lies your answer. Mm. And it's not what you would think. You would think it's a socioeconomic thing. And there's a lot of that in play, that social science deals with it and psychology deals with it. But the simplest way to the answer to this is ask yourself what would drive you to violence and you will come up with the answer faster without the degree. And that is that there's three general bullets that pierce the one's ability and will in america we have this thing that you need two things to be violent you need the will and the ability well since everybody has the ability to be violent the law contradicts or opposes their will so yeah. one would think well i'm not going to do that because i'll just spend time in jail this is mm -hmm. right so this is the general leverage of accountability but when you have that will when i don't care train against that Yep. And let me know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. So before you, do, before you try to develop will, learn how to absorb the will of others, not necessarily in a physical punching bag, stress inoculation, comma, comma, um, more of a psychological acceptance of the here and now. It's what I call the victim orientation process. You can go on my YouTube channel and see the video. Victim orientation process. It is the process by which an individual is both physically and psychologically accepting what's happening at the now. Now, if you talk to rape victims, you will find that women will go through the whole event in denial. Yep. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. Brother, I walked into a man's house high on crack because I knew there was $3,000 in the dresser drawer in the bedroom because I had his kid out in the car who owed me money. You see how this went down? Yeah. I walked right through the door, pent the dog, got up and, you know, they were, they were in their 50s, man. I'm a street fighting thug. I walked in the house and grabbed it. Now, people think that that's funny or that's cool. And no, it shows you the depths and depravity that I went to as a slave to my Addiction. What are you talking mm -hmm. about, cool? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that the people who don't care that I was at, that's what's hunting you. And you need to put the people that you're training in those positions because that's who's walking in your door trying to home invade you. That's who's jacking your car. The person who doesn't care, who's walking in without a care in the world and whose daydream is your worst nightmare. And that's mm -hmm. the missing element of being a good victim. Because what makes you... a let me back up. What makes you a good person is what makes you a great victim. Yeah. Yeah. That, wow. That's, that's a really powerful statement. You, you've actually got a lot of really quotable elements. I, I think I'm going to make about a dozen memes out of this. <laughs> <laughs> you've got away with words, my friend. It's, uh, this, 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 there's so many pieces of this that I've uh, just been nodding along. Um, actually, what you mentioned about being a good victim or understanding, understanding the uh, psychology of who might be hunting you. Uh, I actually just read a book called uh, Sheep No More by uh, mm. Jonathan Gilliam. Uh, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've uh, read it or heard of it, but uh, he talks a lot about um, creating a threat package uh, for your life and, and where you're vulnerable, who might be targeting you, uh, <laughs> why they might be targeting you. And it, it's a really interesting way. Like he uses, a, he's an ex-Navy SEAL turned FBI guy. Um, so he uses like, physical security principles to apply to your life. And I found it quite interesting, um, just a different perspective on how to actually create a profile for where you're vulnerable and who you're vulnerable to and what motivations they may have and so on and so forth. And I think that, uh, yeah, that's really powerful for people to understand because as I said before, we, we tend to create this romanticized two dimensional, you know, bad guy that's going to, or you know, we, we spend all our time training for the sucker punch in a nightclub as opposed to you know, real, violence with someone who's actually committed to harming you. Well, I think you have to understand who your victims are, 
right? My victims aren't 22 year old guys going out to bars and getting fights at two in the morning. Look, if you keep getting into a fight at the bar at two in the morning, you got bigger problems than martial arts, buddy. Get into a, <laughs> get into a program and get some damn help. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, whenever I see these guys that advertise themselves on on Facebook or wherever as self defense instructors because they've been in four hundred real fights, you know, like, dude, you got into four hundred real fights, you, you you're a very unlikable person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something wrong with you. I've been in the I've been in the bouncing business most of my life. It's the one job I've done more than anything. And to my own dismay, I never planned it that way. It's just I guess when you're good at something, it's just it's always the last thing that you can go to, right? You, you and, and so, I, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you wind up doing that. You become really good at risk assessment. And you and listen, when you when you talked about that gentleman's book, it sounds just it's funny because I, I hear that and I was like, that's exactly what in my book it has. It's funny how those things pop up in different places, and you think you're clever, and then somebody else says the same thing. You're like, oh. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Right. But when you say consider your threat package, um, I know my role. My role is the conduit to the virtuous person. Mm -hmm. So the person who hears threat package is somebody who's in a position or posture of um, risk assessment, mm -hmm. mitigating threats, um, policing areas or some security position. Yes. Yes. Okay. There are people going after or researching or looking for bad guys. I'm saying that my position is to reach an audience that says, instead of looking at a threat package, I want you to identify your own victimality. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do you look at a victimality? You say to yourself, well, I know that there's three reasons to drive violence, three reasons that drive violence. Here are the three personal gain through criminal means. The second one is psychological or emotional displacement. And the third one, is lack of social structure or accountability. And you would, so the examples of the first one, we all know the bad guy, he's looking to get high. He's going to jump you. He's going to rob you. He's going to, he wants your money, your sex, your life, your property. Okay. That's the bad guy. And the second one is the one who's road rage, domestic violence, workplace violence, who sees himself as the victim. Yep. Right. Yep. And the, Third one is something that you're starting to see now in some places, which is a second world attitude of get it while it's there because it's going to run out. Mm -hmm. Like then there's no, the police ain't coming, Holmes. If you, this is the West Side. Police ain't going to be here for a few minutes. You got some time to clean out. Yeah, police, the police don't come here, brother. No, nah, please don't come here, Holmes. You need to you drag your body. You need to drag your body over a block if you want police to come. That's right. And fire some gunshots because they ain't coming unless they hear some gunshots. <laughs> So anyway, um, so those are the three drivers of violence. And so you have to say to yourself, what, what are you in a culturally, are you in, a, in an environment that has culturally, cultural norms that people problem solve through violence? So uh, there's cultural norms where there's lack of social structure, accountability, where people, they problem solve lower, lower income people, people with alcoholism, drug addiction. You find that people, you, 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 you will stand up straight, which is backhand, boy. Mm -hmm. And that's just how you learn to solve problems. And, and so you'll have those people and you get an offender bender with those people or you bump into them. And so those are just mishaps. And so what you really start to do is filter opportunity and you start to see through filtering your victimality, how you are actually a victim before mm -hmm. you start, because the question still remains. Remember, we have to ask ourselves, if I was to ask you, Joe, what weapon, we're going to go hunting. What weapon do you want? You got a fishing pole, you got a spear, you got a grenade and you got a handgun. What weapon you want? You would logically say, well, what am I, what am I hunting? Mm -hmm. So we are actually in the one business where context determines content. What we're mm -hmm. used to is we're used to somebody telling you a system it's going to work over every other system. All you need to do is invest more, more time and coincidentally, mm -hmm. more money. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying to yourself, let me find the problem, then I'll work the solution. They go, here's the solution. Let me show you how the problem's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and I say that to say, like, if you were to say, well, every fight goes to the ground. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up, hold up. I, I'm, I'm going to part words. I'm going I'm to hold you up there. I don't think that that's true. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing. So you still have to, you have to say, well, you can't, you can't win if it's more than one. Whoa, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to, you have to kind of go against the grain a little bit there, but um, fi figuring out what is hunting you 
determines what you're going to need. And when you figure out your victimality, you'll be better equipped to figure out the tools that you need. If you, if you are a guy over 40, you're probably not going to be a victim of rape. So mm -hmm. don't spend all your time trying to work submissions from the guard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now your investment is better. Now your time is short. Now you have a clinical solution to a complex problem of violence. You know what she's hunting. You know that if you're a single woman, if you live on a ranch and no one's around to hear you, wait a second, do you collect money for a living? Do you hire and fire people for a living? Mm -hmm. Do you have kids? So are you going to be defending you or your kids? Make the decision or learn to fight with both of them. Go. You got about three seconds. Yeah. And yeah. So these are the positions, questions that determine one's victimality and then determine their response or like you said, their threat package. Yeah. I, I like, um, I like the terminology of blueprinting. Uh, that's, what, that's what I tend to use in my, in my, uh, my teaching is that we, it's really important that you have a blueprint in mind of what you're going to do when this situation occurs, because under stress, you can't think creatively. It's, it, you can't make a plan when your heart rate is at 180 beats per minute and you're trying to figure out whether to get out the window yourself or run to your children. Um, like it's, it's too late at that point to think uh, uh, accurately and creatively to come up with a good plan. You're just going to do the first thing that comes to mind and hope that it was the best decision in, in hindsight. Um, so I think that's uh, yeah, that idea of, of understanding what's hunting you so you can have a more realistic picture of what the situation is likely to be and create a plan, even if you don't practice it, at least the fact that you've thought about it gives you a leg up that if you'd never thought about it. Absolutely. It creates a discussion, you know? I mean, if you, if you, if you say to somebody, listen, here's the reality. If you've ever called a loved one and they haven't answered the phone for 20 minutes and then it starts going straight to voicemail, and another 20 minutes you call family, friends, and next thing you know, you're calling the hospital and all you want to hear is the sound of that door opening up. Tell me I'm lying. Mm. That's the truth if anybody's yep. ever been there. You're like, oh, where you been? And why are you like, there's this big sigh that comes through. And yep. you really need to talk to people about that and understand that if you don't make it through that door, there's a value system there. And that's where it starts. That's where you, you start to program people's will. Not through, not through being angry and through raging out identifying their victimality, identifying what's important to them, getting into their lives and not lying to themselves and saying, listen, I'm living a tough, I mean, the people who walk into my door, are people who know what they don't know and want to fill it. Yeah. Everybody else is playing pretend, right? Yeah. Yep. And so when you get people, and, and so like you said, you like the idea of blueprint. We're the same way. We use the same terminology, something like a, a, a fight plan, right? Mm -hmm. A predetermined idea. And we may go off course, but that's okay. We know how to fly. We're not relying on a preset. Yep. So we have, we kind of in our training, the first thing of course is be desensitized and learn how to move and there's all of that. But when you're talking about the victim violence relationship, the best thing you can do for yourself is understand who the victim is, then prepare yourself and you'll have an idea who the, I mean, it's very simple. Because if, if you're, you know, where you go in your life, you're going to be a victim of home invasion, workplace violence, or somewhere in between. I mean, if you're that person, you're going to ask yourself, where are you going to be a victim of violence? Where are most people? Where do you live? Figure that out and then find the tools you need for the problem. So if violence is the problem, then you have to find the solution to that problem. And counter violence is, is that attitude is that attitude is counter violence. You have to know violence. What is it doing? What's its characteristic? Well, it's asymmetrical. It has uh, uh, intent. It knows beforehand what it wants to do. It has drive. It has definitive pressure. So it's like a linebacker coming at you. There's an active attacker. So all of these things, now you get in, you, so you understand the victim. You don't understand your victimality. You understand that, hey, this is where I'm, and so when you go back and you say, now that I have, because I know my, my victimality, I have backdoor become smarter at a soft skill of predatorial recognition, understanding power curve displacement, all of these things that go along with being smarter about violence and victim relationship. Right. Mm. You're sitting in the, you have to sit in the war room of it kind of thing. You just can't go out and expect that if I do this style, it's going to work against any attacker at any time. I mean, it, it, we really need to put that stuff to bed. You really need to, you know, gravitate to a higher level of bar. It says, stop playing for the guy who's drunk at two in the morning at the bar because it's not really saying much for yourself. Try the guy coming through the door and one of them got a gun. And if they get through you, they rape your wife and your daughter. Go. 
Yeah. I want that yeah. bar to be high. But I want you to train it smart. So when you inherit the hard skill, you do so clinically and you do so first, then it's a drive through uh, option, obviously. If someone's there for a 90 minutes or three hours, Joe, you can't be technical. You don't want to start. And this was the beef I had with JKD people, kind of why they probably see me as an outsider. Because I don't think it makes very good sense to show someone who's only has three hours a pox out and a lops out. Yep. <laughs> That's just yep. a, yep. I don't get it. I don't get that. I don't, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, I think that's I think that's sort of the um, the the martial arts conundrum is that a lot of our systems have evolved uh, for the needs of martial artists, which are people that are going to train yeah you know, multiple days a week for years and years and years. And yeah, you know, the uh, even if we look at the history of martial arts, I mean, a lot of systems were developed because you were going to start training your warrior class from the time they were six years of age, and by the time they're sixteen, they'll be useful in battle. You know, like that's it's a ten year process, not the the uh, single mom who wants to do a three hour self-defense seminar to feel safer. I mean, it, she's not going to develop a powerful front kick. <laughs> like that's, it's not going to happen in that time. She needs to know what we're talking about. Uh, uh, understanding reality. I think having an, uh, having an honest um, perspective. And so you always go outside yourself and you say, I, I wrote that down, by the way, systems are developed around the martial artists, not, you know, that, that, that is the boundary set and so forth. And, and I think that that is, a, it's what we call in our business a kind of, it's a mismatch. It's a mismatch. So you can't train for the very same thing that you're doing to defend yourself with against. Did I say that right? It's like martial arts <laughs> masturbation. So if I'm defending, if I'm defending, if I'm calling myself a reality, now let's be honest, if I'm calling myself this reality-based competition and traditional, right? Or something like that. There's some few people, you're managing violence podcasts, so you would consider maybe some branches of JKD, Krav Maga, Combat. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some semblance of reality there, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and I think that... Um, it, out of all those, you have to say that there's a lot of things you could show and, and to tell someone that you're going to come in and give them that, you can't do that anymore. You have to be able to raise the bar a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, like you said, it just depends on, depends on who you're teaching. It depends on, one, what their reality is, what's likely to be what they're going to face, and, and two, how much time do they have and how much willingness do they have to commit to this? Because if I've got someone who I know is going to train with me for three days a week and they're going to be with me for several years and they're going to get to a quote unquote black belt level, we can stagger that process and we can develop some skills and some attributes and we can, we can make them very, very useful. If I've got someone who I know is only going to be with me for a couple of days, they're going to pay for a couple of private lessons and then they're probably never going to train again. That completely changes the material I want to give them. Absolutely. And, and, and again, that when, if I'm doing, let's say, a Wing Chun thing, and I'm having a Wing Chun guy attack me, the immediate thing that comes to mind should be, is the Wing Chun guy going to break into my home and try to rape my wife? <laughs> That's right. He's probably not going to so, do it with a lap so, Right, right. So your point of reference is off from the beginning. Yep. So tell me who you are. So I have my courses are generally based around the same relative probability of violence for people over the age, you know, in a reality based format. And then we'll say, he's, here's the general things. Now I'm going to ask you as individuals, we're going to put these individual props around like the stage. So you'll see a, like a Western prop or you'll see a, a boutique prop or a work prop. Like some people have, we're going to go train in the elevator. We're going to go train over here, right? Sure. But you do that prop and ask that person to live that, like be at the sink, do some dishes instead of always standing in front of somebody, high fiving them and going. Yep. Exactly. Right. Because that's always the same orientation. It's always the same. So right from the reference point, you have to start with, who is my bad guy? Let's have a rise of the villain. Let's stop making our villain this guy who walks up and does a cheesy wrist grab. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> right? The, the old villain. Grab. Oh, man. Yeah. We, could do, we could do a whole podcast about wrist grabs. <laughs> so anybody who knows violence is going to say, I'm going to grab you by your hair, punch you in the damn face, throw you in the back of this van, and charge dudes 200 bucks to come hit this. Yeah. yeah. Wrist grab now, lady. Yeah, it's it, no one's uh, no one's grabbing you by the wrist with ill intent. It's, and so this is what this is what I mean. So who is feeding you? What do they look like? And can you spar this? Because I'm I'm telling you, it's hard. 
because you can't do this. You can spar to raise your athleticism, your conditioning, your wherewithal, the toughness of it all. And yes, you need it. Yes. But when you scenario, you can't 100% scenario train because you never develop the athleticism. You yes. develop just the gulp, just that first, boop, oh, yep, that first quick orientation and go. Yes, right? 100%. You have to, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm just agreeing with you. It's, it's something that has been part of my evolution. So I started off with traditional martial arts, got into competition martial arts when I was you know, late teens, um, got to an international level in judo and uh, a couple other wrestling styles. But also at the same time, I was bouncing and I got into reality based self defense through Richard Dimitri and then became a Krav Maga instructor later on. Um, so I, I went down the scenario rabbit hole um, for a number of years. But what I found was actually, uh, as, I, as I started training people, and I, was, I realized I was neglecting some of the elements of combat sport that had developed my attributes. Um, because it's very it wasn't, well said. Yeah, I mean, it's very well said. It, it, there's, there's multiple components. Everything's a training tool. And I think scenario replication is a very important training tool, but also somewhat safe resistance training, whether it be rolling, sparring, whatever. That is a super important tool for, for developing timing, distance, speed, all, all that stuff that's, that's important for actually fighting. Because scenario training only gives you the, the emotional aspect. It's very, very hard to develop technique and power through scenario training because you just can't get the reps in as, as easily. Um, and, I, and I think that's it's so neglected. I think sports, we, I had this conversation with Paul Sharp actually, um, uh, but sports yeah, he's training- Yeah, he's a Matt Thornton guy. Yeah, yeah, yes. And also Ryan Hoover. Ryan Hoover just um, was talking yeah. about the same thing, that sporting martial arts miss the reality, but reality miss the competitiveness uh, and, and the actual physicality. And uh, I think both of them are important and you need to balance that in your training. Yeah, that was, that was my proponent. That was the central theme behind will and skill. And they, Paul Vunak started calling them self-preservation and self-perfection. Um, and it was constantly what I saw in today's world was that, that, that you had, like, if you were to polarize it, you would say, I have a left that's comic book martial arts and I have a right that's, um, put camo on to take out the garbage martial arts. <laughs> right? I'd, actually, I'd, actually, I'd actually rather hang out with the comic book guys, to be honest. I don't, yeah, I really, you know, I'm caught in the middle, right? Because these guys are over here putting bullets in their shot glasses and who I, and you know, and these guys are over here doing praying mantis and I didn't know, but they're both going to stop the bad guy. And so I think in, in, we even, we even call that, um, like when, when I first seen Lee train, I, I thought to myself, I was sitting with Eddie Cohen, Eddie Cohen goes, Oh yeah, that's the, that's the, uh, European doorman style. Yeah. yeah. Where that fence is always present. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I don't over here. That that was never a thing for me. I never have that over here. I had people throwing punches at me, and the minute I tried to put my hands on them, they'd be like, "Man, I'll sue you." It was it was different. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. A man. And it was and as a victim, it was different. Someone doesn't come up to me and give me the opportunity. Now, if I'm in a number two style of violence, emotional or psychological displacement, i.e., road rage, and Duke gets up to me and I put a fence up, and yes, that's a that's perfect spot for that. Right. And so I really appreciated that kind of give you an opportunity to deescalate um, all of that. But my normality, the default position of a victim is, you know, you're in a fight because someone just hits you. Yes. Go. Yes. Go. That's it. There is no time. And so instead of using the OODA loop, which is, is you know, and I like it again, it's, but it's for a military brain. And it's, it's really just identifying what's happening. It's not really helping you develop it. And so I created a thing in that victim orientation process as a matter of space and time. So it's a get ready, a get set, and a get go. Mm-hmm. Those are your time frames. And they also illuminate, if you're in a get go, you're in a judo range, you're in a head button and elbow range, you're in a clinch range. Mm-hmm. You don't have time to deescalate. And if someone threw a punch, all you had time to do is cover. You didn't intercept. Sorry, bro. And by the way, he probably ain't going to feed you a jab. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, man. And I think it's, it's interesting, actually, you mentioned that, um, you know, reality is sometimes you get hit. And that's the first time you know you're in a fight was that you've, you've been hit. And I think that's one of those pieces that sometimes gets lost in uh, quote unquote reality based self defense is that it's, it's become more and more, uh, I think there's more and more instructors that are doing a, a, a low contact or a light contact version uh, and just doing kind of cheap scenarios. Um, 
if you've never been hit, if you've never been rocked, it's a bad time to figure out what that feels like when it's real. I mean, you, you, you need to have that sort of reference point. You go, oh, okay, I just got hit. I've been lit up a little bit. I know what to do now because I've experienced this before. Uh, it's, it's super hard to learn that on the fly when the consequence of you not acting properly might be the next one is a knife in your back or, you know, you've been dragged off somewhere. Right. So that is a really tricky thing to do is you say, I can, okay, so I will dip my foot in the pool of sparring because I will get hit. And that's really the goal is to experience of someone trying to hit you. And then you can add the emotional content of somebody trying to hurt you. That emotional content management is usually the thing that changes besides the technique in the reality versus sport. And so when you're looking to provide that perfection preservation, or as I call it, um, the surgical soldier, the elegant savage, I mean, Muhammad Ali was famous for it, right? Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Um, and it, it says that I need will, I need skill, and then I need a training pl platform that will download and hardwire, and, and hardwire my DNA to have a flinch response whether it's get ready, get set, or get go. Now that in itself is hard. It's very easy to assume that if I hit him first, but I'm teaching people who are virtuous citizens. And remember what I said, the things that make them good people are the things that make them great victims and they weren't raised by boot camp instructors. And Mrs. Jones is not hammer fisting this lady or this other person first over a roll of toilet paper. That's not how she was raised. Yeah. It's not what she was taught. And that's why she's a good victim. And so you have to put yourself in her shoes if you expect to really make a difference in affecting change in the self-protection reality-based world. Yeah, that's a, it's a brilliant place to leave the interview on, my friend. Um, this has been a fantastic episode. Um, we'll, we'll do the bonus questions in a minute, but for those that will leave you us right now, if they want to learn more about you uh, or they want to book you to do something once, once all the restrictions are lifted and we can train again, <laughs> where can I send them to find out more about you? Uh, yes, uh, focuscounterviolence.com, and obviously the same across the board of social media, Facebook, um, Instagram, YouTube, and uh, full of educational videos and so forth. And um, So we are doing some online stuff here and there with uh, privates and so forth, keeping people active and uh, actually talking about what self-protection means in this time because it shifts a little bit. Absolutely. I think as we head into a more unstable uh, yeah, global situation, uh, the, the need for, I guess, more understanding of uh, yeah, what, what may not normally visit first world suburbia uh, is, is super important. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, for our Patreon subscribers, make sure you head on over to Patreon for the bonus questions. For now, thank you very much for your time, Michael. It's been a great pleasure and uh, I'm sure it'll be a very popular episode. Thank you. Be well and safe, brother. How good was that? I told you it would be awesome. Michael Van Beek. What a great episode. Make sure you check out all his social media links and his website and his book when it comes out. I can't wait to grab a copy. I think it's going to be excellent. Thank you for listening to Season 5, Episode 1. Don't forget to head over onto Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash managing violence for all the bonus content. We do need your support to keep this show going. It costs money. It doesn't make money. It costs money. So the more you can contribute, uh, anyone who can contribute, even a couple of bucks, it all makes a huge difference on my end. So thank you once again to our Patreon subscribers and to everybody who listens week in, week out. I hope you're keeping safe wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Can't wait to get back and see you again for Season 5, Episode 2, coming up next week. Until then, I'll talk to you next time.